according to the schedule, I am the closing speaker, but I think it would be uh, a much more engaging use of time if I could join this conversation um, because I think ultimately it represents why we're here. Let me give you a brief background and then tell you a short story. I'm an educator, a, a professor. Um, I just uh, uh, finished a, a fellowship, a teaching fellowship at Yale. Now I'm teaching at Quinnipiac University in, in Connecticut. And uh, the message I want to leave with you is that young people are ready. They're ready to serve. They need to be asked. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough as an undergraduate uh, to go to a school that had an ROTC program. I was not a product of that program. I did fly for the Navy. I'm a product of the, uh, the, the Top Gun phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> but it was that exposure to ROTC as a regular civilian student that changed my life. I don't think the goal at Harvard of bringing ROTC back, or at Yale for that matter, is to acquire 5% of the student body um, for the officer corps. It's to have that connection, to begin rebuilding that bridge. As an undergraduate, not participating in ROTC, I had close friends in uniform. I took ROTC classes. This is an opportunity my students at Yale don't have. They don't even know that they don't have it. I did an independent study with, with a Marine captain, something that could not happen here at Harvard. I put a question to my class just last week that I hope captures the sentiment among young people today. We were talking about the draft. I asked specifically the females in my class if they thought it was unfair that only males were subject to selective service registration. For those of you who don't know, uh, that's the, the vestiges of the draft. When males in America turn 18, they register for the selective service. Females don't have to. The women in my class thought that was unfair, but not for the reason I thought, and probably not for the reason you think. It's not because they thought selective service was some kind of unfair burden, that war was an unmitigated evil, and that men should not have to register to fight. They thought it was something being denied them. That selective service was a privilege, a call to service, that should be shared uniformly. Therein lies the hope. Therein is the hope for reconciliation. Young people are desperate to serve. They are looking for ways to serve. They just haven't been asked. Don't believe everything you read about their generation, because I think they are our salvation, <coughs> if we can provide the guidance and the leadership to capitalize on that desire. Um, I hope we have time for some more engagement on that. Good point. I think that's a fantastic point. I mean, look at the history of the military in the United States, groups that were excluded, African Americans, et cetera, their first claim was, we want to have equal respect as citizens, so we want to have the same kind of access to military service as anybody else. And uh, this, I think, is a classic example of that as well. One other quick point. One take on why the death penalty is a problem constitutionally is because it's inflicted against men much more often than women. And why is that? Because juries respect the moral responsibility of men more than women. And uh, if women are executed at the same rate as men, in a very strange way, that's a sign of equal citizenship. Well, you really pulled that one out, didn't you? <laughs> Dad, yeah. Getting right back to where we were, do you have a question in the back? Great, we got a microphone coming your way. I'm afraid, uh, as seems to be happening a lot today, it's more of a, a comment than a question. Uh, considering just what Ivy graduates have done to Wall Street and what Ivy League law school graduates have done to our legal system, et cetera, do we really want people from the elite colleges in the military? Uh, Coming from Britain, when you, when you arrive at Sandhurst, the, the equivalent of West Point, you, you get given a big booklet that tells you the history of the officer corps in Britain. And 
and it, it's very openly, uh, it very openly admits that during the 19th century we essentially turned, we, we, we added lots of nice uniforms and, and glitzy stuff to attract the elite and make them our officers. And that led to quality control problems. Because, and in fact, it, it's, it sound, it's very much a Labour government pamphlet in the way that it sounds like we're trying, you know, we're trying to make it much more accessible now and, and a lot more based on quality. Um, on the other hand, I do know that when I go back to Britain and I go back in the army and I'll probably will be guarding Buckingham Palace or something, I, I will be serving alongside my future king, which you don't necessarily, you're not going to have that here. Um, uh, so, so I don't, I, don't, I think the, the, having also served briefly in the US military, served alongside people from all over, I, I really think perhaps the whole idea that Americans from elite colleges being better is 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 a bit of a misnomer. If you, I, I've even I'm off to do another FTX with ROTC just as a civilian in a few weeks, and 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 I found that that the spread, even whether you go to Tufts or wherever, is, is you can have excellent officers or mediocre officers. It, it, doesn't seem to change that much depending on the college. But one thing I can tell you is, is I've had the privilege of, of teaching at the, the Tufts, uh, at Tufts uh, for two semesters now on counterinsurgency. And um, I don't have a PhD, I don't have an NMA, just like with the undergraduate admissions, Tufts will take everyone. And um, There's it, hope for me. <laughs> but what, what I can say is just uh, teaching reality, th this uh, seems to make a huge difference. Because this semester I've had a class of uh, 19, no, 17, and three people have already signed up for the military. <laughs> Two kids have joined Army ROTC, one is off to OCS Marines. All you need to give them is reality. And I think that brings us back to what Frank said and Miss Academic said, which is that is talk, it's about the lack of reality at places like Harvard, elite colleges in general. There's so much about opinion and so very little about reality. And if I can, as a random person, inspire several people, that's three people who already joined, several more who probably will be joining, get them to see reality for what it, what is, what it is. What would change if you had professors who are, who are less interested in publishing for each other's sake? And what if you had people talking about reality rather than opinion? That probably would make, in my view, uh, the, the biggest difference of all. And I don't see how that can possibly change. Because as Frank sort of... Uh, alluded to that America's elite is completely out of touch with reality. Is that the self-licking ice cream syndrome? I think that's what it is, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if you all, we've talked a lot about, about elites and the, un there is a study that's available to all of us, it's public domain, um, about who actually joins the military. And what that study showed is that essentially the great middle class of America are those who join. Uh, the lower 10% could not join, and it was not because of their economic background or that could have been a contributing factor. It was because they could not pass the requirements to become either enlisted or officer candidates in any of the services. And the upper 10% at the time the study was taken, which is, I guess, before the crash, uh, weren't that interested. And it is an all-volunteer force. But the rest of it comes from right in the middle of the pack and, in, and across all of the ethnic lines that we would expect um, and was very much representative, if that's the correct term, for what uh, the cross-section of the society would be. That's who resides in the military. I'd like to make a couple comments. Um, I think we could pit anecdote against anecdote. I loved yours, I loved yours. Where do we end up with? Nowhere, but I think you can actually find positive correlations between aptitude in college uh, and performance. And uh, ultimately, of course, there will be exceptions to every rule. I fully accept that. But I look at uh, my graduating class, for example, at the Naval Academy, from which we had something like 23 admirals. And as it turned out, uh, 19 of those 23 were in the top 10 percent of the class. Is that just bum luck? I don't think so. I mean, I honestly think that if you've proven a high level of aptitude when you're 16 and 17, and in order to get in here, you've proven that, I think that you can get a positive correlation uh, between aptitude and performance, as we heard, however, with one exception. Uh, I wouldn't take those people who were destined to be executives at AIG and, say, become admirals in the Navy. There are service-oriented people in the IVs, too. I pointed out my daughter. There are scores like her who want to do service. 
uh, very highly qualified, high aptitude, service-oriented people, those are the people that I would go after. Okay. Um, responding to the point about does the military need the Ivy League, I think Frank addressed this very well. The Ivy League needs the military. Um, what the military brings really can't be quantified. Um, that, that culture of values of service above self. Uh, a word about reality, and forgive me for another anecdote, but uh, one of the capstone experiences of my Yale seminar is taking the class to West Point, to pairing each student for a day with a cadet, and then reconvening to have a class about duty and citizenship, which, by the way, is the title of my seminar at Yale. And it is a transformational experience. Two of my Yale students, much to their mother's horror, met with recruiters after uh, finishing uh, my, my class. These are kids who three months earlier didn't know the difference between a corporal and a colonel. Expose them to reality, expose them to peers their age in uniform, and I think they answered the call. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> just to follow up on the reconciliation issue, uh, the work we do at Columbia, uh, we try to stay away from the term elites and elite schools. Uh, we feel that it's a divisive term, that if you're not from those schools, if you're in Washington and you attended a good university, but without a label of elite, it's divisive. And like Professor Hicks says, perhaps it insults dignity. So we try very hard to stay away from that terminology because we think it's divisive. The second thing, anybody who's ever been to Columbia on a Saturday night in the fraternity house would define elite a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll strike that last sentence from, from the active report. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I, I just wanted to um, invite a comment, uh, invite a little more from, from you, Mr. Dr. Harbaugh? Ken. Captain. Ken. Ken. So one of the things I hoped you would speak about is, uh, relates a little bit to those serving those who serve in the sense that I was very inspired by your organization and what it offers to returning veterans. And it seems to me there's a point of contact with this idea of service because we've talked about the importance of spreading the burden and making it something that everybody does. But it seems like your organization is, is based on the idea that, that service gives more, no, gets more than it gives. Anyway, I'd like you to, if, if you're following my train of thought and you see validity in it, would you speak to the value of giving people the chance to continue to serve. This is not just sort of a two-year deal. This could be a lifetime deal. Right. <clears throat> and, and I think this is a critical step on the 1,000-mile the journey towards reconciliation. I run an organization called The Mission Continues. What we are trying to do at its most fundamental level is change the conversation about returning veterans and returning wounded veterans in particular because there's this emerging narrative perpetuated by the media and to some degree by us in academia that those who come home are damaged goods. That what we owe them is care and just care. I make no dispute with those who say our highest obligation as a country is to provide for those who bled for us. That's a given. But we have to acknowledge that they have something left to give. As a matter of recognizing their human dignity, we have to recognize that they are not just charity cases. I remember in particular a quote from a Marine I sat with lying in a recovery ward at Bethesda. He told me, I lost my legs, that is all. I did not lose my desire to serve or my pride in being an American. The mission continues, provides young men like this and young women with fellowships to re-engage them in public service so that they don't have to worry about foot, putting food on the table when they are, are discharged so that they can commit to a short period of public service to prove to both themselves and their community that they are still worth something. One of my favorite stories from an early fellow of ours, 
um, a, a, a soldier who lost a leg in Iraq, came back, was being well cared for by his government, was living off of his disability. A letter arrives in the mail. It's a $500 check from an organization that uh, used to, to my knowledge, still does mail a $500 check to every uh, wounded soldier, marine, airman, sailor as a sign of thanks. Felt pretty good opening that letter. He went out. He, uh, he bought an Xbox. For those of you who don't know, that's a video game machine. Um, he bought a, a couple of games and spent the next month on the couch. We tell people like Joe, you're better than that. Get off the couch. You have something left to give. Keep serving. Just because you took the uniform off does not mean you don't have anything left to give this country. I think if we recognized the human dignity issue related to service, we would see our returning soldiers and our returning wounded in particular for what they have left to give, not just for what they have already sacrificed for us. And is there not a reciprocal for that that they need it? You're not just doing it to be nice for them. They need it. They need it. Joe needed a challenge. You need, they need somebody not to charity, them. Not charity, a challenge. Yeah. And we need it because that will provide incentive for those others who return that we're fulfilling our promise of care and rehabilitation and reconnection in the community so they can lead productive lives. That's important to us if you want an all-volunteer force because if people perceive that that isn't the case, then those who would, might want to volunteer are going to have second and third thoughts. There's a question over here, sir. Well, I'd like to offer a few comments and observations on what I heard today, and if there's a question in this, fine. Um, firstly, I heard throughout the day several times uh, the word warrior referred to, and indeed, uh, it's an auspicious and honorable profession and role. But also, in terms of the need for reconciliation, I think also uh, I hear people talking about the need for scholar warriors. And that if we're going to deal with the kind of conflicts that we are dealing with now and in the future, uh, we're going to need people like a General Petraeus who has a PhD from Princeton. And it, as I understand, when he looks for filling out his staff, he looks for people with PhDs. The second observation is, uh, quite honestly, I was a little surprised that if we're talking about reconciliation, I heard a number of people sort of play the blame game today. Um, you know, back in the 60s, I think we used to say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think the more contemporary twist on this is that if you don't see yourself as part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. Uh, I think there's enough blame to go around uh, with all parties uh, in, in terms of bashing, so to speak. And I think what, what we really need isn't so much more ivies in the military or military uh, in the Ivies, uh, because, I mean, th those are just bodies, if you will. Unless those two institutions, and I use that word very broadly, unless their cultures broaden, then the individuals won't thrive. It's like, you know, having a garden, and I want to put more marigolds in my garden, but if I'm not providing the fertilizer and putting the marigold in a place for it to thrive, why bother? So I think both sort of domains, uh, the, their cultures need to burn. And you know, when you look at our country, we have a very rich culture. And I think the more our institutions reflect that, then I think the more productive they can be in working with each other. Thank you. Uh, Roz, I think the rostrum is yours. Lucas? You have to come down. Don't bring your microphone. No. <laughs> Members of the panel, thank you very much for this last session together. We are very